housing crisis is wreaking havoc nationally. Our podcast discusses how it is playing out specifically in Black Berkeley, California, chronicling the lived experiences behind what people call gentrification, detailing our endeavor for our right to stay and our right to return, brought to you by Healthy Black Families. I am your host, Deb, and this is Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. Welcome. Randolph Bell of Creative Development Partners. It's good to have you with us, Randolph. Hey, it's good to be here. So let's begin with you please telling us who Creative Development Partner is. Certainly. So Creative Development Partners uh, is a real estate development investment and consulting firm um, founded here in Oakland, California, uh, somewhere right around tw- uh, 2013. Uh, it was a very uh, project specific um, uh, endeavor at the time. And then we've gone on to, to kind of expand our offerings. Um, myself, I come to the work, um, you know, first as a creative, um, a creative professional. I, I was an artist for many, many years, um, an entrepreneur. Uh, I did some community development, um, and then that's all of what I bring here to the creative development team, which is myself and two other partners. The two other partners, uh, Jeremy Liu and Jason Vargas, uh, both came from community development and real estate development and ran or developed very large projects. And so we came together um, at that time, like I said, around a specific project, but we've been moving the projects um, to date forward, um, to try and do more with the real estate development process. So it's somewhere between, um, for-profit development, nonprofit development, somewhere right in the middle that makes, um, sense, um, to us. Um, let's see here. So the only thing that I would say is the artist in me, um, always wants to find creative solutions, um, and that's also supported by my partnership here. Um, I did two stints at a nonprofit, at different nonprofit organizations that really provided the basis for the work that I'm doing here at the Creative Development Partners. Um, that was one, the East Bay Resource Center for Nonprofit Support, which was a technical assistance and fundraising library where I was the director of uh, information. That's the most uh, uh, oblique title ever. Um, and then I also was the special assistant to the CEO at urban strategies council, which was a a policy research and advocacy organization, um, and really specific, um, um, activities that we did that is pertinent to the work that I'm doing now is facilitate the negotiation of, community benefit agreements on large scale real estate developments. Um, and so we did Hunter's point shipyard. We did, uh, which was a massive, um, uh, repositioning or, uh, it was a, uh, the development of a decommissioned, uh, naval air, uh, naval, naval station in San Francisco. Um, we also did Oak to ninth, which is now called Brooklyn basin, uh, which is the largest, um, development, I think in, since the war in Oakland. Um, And so we would work uh, at the intersection between the real estate development process, the city um, and the community. And we would provide, uh, I'd like to say translation services in the uh, pursuit of community benefit agreements. Um, The last two things that I'll bring up are um, two, uh, two additional assets. Uh, that I bring to the work to CDP is um, a, another business called RBA Creative that I run with my wife. It's a gallery and co-working space. Um, and then Support Oakland Artists is a nonprofit that I founded in 2002 from work that we started, right, you know, really in about 1994. Um, and that is technical assistance, marketing, fiscal sponsorship for 
um, artists and um, non-incorporated individuals. Yeah, you know, thinking back on what has happened to artists in Oakland through this gentrification process is quite a thing. So you've experienced this um, hands-on in the artist community too, I take it. Oh, yeah, I have a, I have a, uh, interesting perspective on this. I I'm from San Francisco mm-hmm. and a lot of the gentrification happened because of the influx of people in general from San Francisco. There was an influx of people that came to San Francisco at a time. And then when they got pushed out of San Francisco, they came to Oakland. Um, right. and I've, you know, got a particular opinion about that. But uh, that happened with the artist community also, right? Right. So it was was kind of um, parallel processes, which ultimately have the same effect on Oakland as it relates to displacement and, you know, what we call gentrification. Um, But it's also kind of two distinct tracks because the artists that are coming over here, this is kind of what I have. Um, noticed in my 31 years in Oakland and being a, a native of San Francisco, because nobody's from San Francisco, you know what I mean? Especially black people. Right. Um, when I, when I, yeah, when I grew up, there were, I think there were somewhere around 14% um, was a black population and now it's under three. Um, but, you know, I got the mm. sense that when people moved to San Francisco, they really deferred to San Francisco and all that it brought, right? Then when they got pushed out of San Francisco and into Oakland, there wasn't that same deference, right? And so Mm -hmm. there was a um, really an inclination to change. Uh, There was an inclination to uh, not feel like you needed to respect anything that Oakland offered and you were ultimately, and I'm making broad generalizations here, they were ultimately bringing the same kind of mindset from wherever the hell they came from. Right. Cause they may have come from places where, you know, that are hostile to blacks. You know what I mean? They deferred to San Francisco Plus, there weren't any black people there that they had to interact with. But Mm. you can't get by, you know, the blackness of Oakland. And so they were they they brought that same, um, you know, I I will say hostility. There's, you know, there's not a better uh, or intolerability. Um, And then that, you know, kind of plays out in all the systems and stuff like that. Right. You know, when they're going in overpaying for property, when they're displacing residents, when they're, you know, doing all that that stuff. So um, and then you mentioned the um, the arts. Um, uh, Oakland has such a rich and diverse uh, cultural legacy um, with, you know, black culture, black music you know, dance, you know, uh, writers and poets, you know, I also think that the artists that came over, um, did not embrace that culture, but they were also, um, there was a natural, um, kind of inclination to try to displace that, um, um, that culture, which is just, you know, that's kind of doubly foul. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, artists are people too. They bring with them their stuff. <laughs> so I hear what you're saying. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's such an important end that you have. And it's so important that you bring all of that to this work. Um, so this work is Equitable Black Berkeley and what Healthy Black Families calls Equity for Black Berkeley. Um, can you explain to us what Equitable Black Berkeley as community development partners understands it is sure sure so let me uh try it one way and then i'll get a little bit more specific so sure in one way to look at this 
uh, Equitable Black Berkeley or Equity for Black Berkeley um, is a once in a lifetime opportunity to do something groundbreaking um, that will serve as a model for the, the city of Berkeley uh, for certainly, but also to how um, you know we make amends um, for the harms that communities have suffered through um, historically. Um, and so that's, you know, that, like for decades upon decades, you know, there's just been harm and this is an opportunity to, um, really correct, to begin to correct There's It's really, um, not, uh, realistic or possible to think that we can just reverse or correct the harms that were done over so many years. But we do see this um, as a, a strategy to devise a solution that rises to the magnitude of the problem. That's what I always, um, that's how I frame this in everybody I'm talking to, is that we cannot try to do um, things in the way that they are typically done, because they typically do not work for communities of color and black people specifically. And so we have to really try and do something um, uh, outside of, uh, uh, what is comfortable. Um, and when we applied for, uh, when we bid on this, um, the RFP that we responded to said that we were to, uh, facilitate a moonshot exercise, which means that we're doing something, you know, kind of way out, but mm -hmm. we have, for, we have couched that moonshot facilitation in, uh, feasibility, right? We're not going to do anything impractical uh, or infeasible. Um, so we think that the only way to to come up with a solution that rises to the magnitude of the problem is if, in fact, that we do things that have never um, been done um, before. Um, so that's that's kind of how we frame it in the big picture. Um, uh, we do think that uh, repairing harm for the black community also repairs communities, the broader community. Um, uh, we just want the black community and the harmed communities to be equity stakeholders in this redevelopment and generate um, an economic return on investment. Um, so we do not have to. Uh, rely on any strategies that are either one time grant driven or not sustainable because it took us this long to get in the situation that we are in. It's going to take at least that long or a factor greater of time to get out of it. And so we have to have um, a funding mechanism um, uh, that is sustainable and sufficient to the, um, to the needs and so that, you know, Equitable Black Berkeley provides that opportunity. Um, it's also, and this is, this goes to people's greater understanding of what it is that we're trying to do. This is a way for everybody to participate in harm repair, right? Not just the city, not just the people who understand it now, but everybody, because it was, you know, uh, the people who don't understand what this is about, who probably had the greatest hand in creating the harm, right? There was just this disrespect uh, and disregard for black communities. Those, those, those people have not gone anywhere. And so it is going to be a way for us to educate um, and have their participation, uh, in harm repair. Um, so that, that's an important piece that we, we try to, um, also, um, uh, make sure that people understand there's a dynamic shift that, um, equitable black Berkeley, um, will accomplish. Um, and the protocols of redevelopment, you know, as they are, um, traditionally undertaking will be shifted. Again, we're asking them to do something um, different. Um, and then lastly, we're, we're asking them to embrace what we call 
community benefit by design, um, which uh, shifts the paradigm. It's the inverse of the, the, the traditional paradigm where a developer bakes in their profit margin and negotiates away the community benefits to a place where we're baking in the community business, the community benefits, and then building a business model around that. Right. So the community is not going to get everything that they want. Nobody ever gets everything that they want. But if we start from that place of what can we bake in, then um, it seems like we will get reasonable returns for the developers as opposed to what traditionally happens is unreasonable returns for the community. So that's kind of just the framework that we're uh, approaching this work with. So just let me see if I got this. Creative development partners will be sort of a go between the developers and the community. Correct? No, actually, I'm going to. So we're just advisors. We're okay. advising the city, we're advising the BART, and we're advising the community. Part of that advising for the community is going to be a capacity building. Um, what I learned in some of the um, projects that I've worked on before, that neighborhood and resident leadership uh, capacity building has to be a part of the entire process. Because if the community knows better how this process works, then they're not at a disadvantage and they can negotiate for themselves better. Um, and, but it's really going to be the community that takes the leads. Healthy Black Families is the anchor uh, institution. Um, the city has their own goals, which are much aligned with the communities. BART has a goal to get the thing built, and then the developers are going to have a goal. So we certainly hope um, that this constituency on the city community side is able to impact what it is and who it is that gets to, to be developed on that site. And it's going to be community centered based on the historic harms to the black residents of South Berkeley. So we're, we're just advisors, you know, we're Got empowering um, the community and city side um, to, to get the most out of this project. And you were brought in by the city of Berkeley? Correct. Got it. Right. Okay. So we're basically contracted by the city of Berkeley and the mayor's office um, and supported through um, a grant from the San Francisco Foundation. Okay. And have there been other endeavors like Equitably Back Berkeley that you know of and if so you know what might they be yeah so we really have not found a perfect match uh, in terms of a precedent project here um, there have certainly been um, projects there are you know there are some some examples of reparations as we're calling them now um, Evanston, Illinois, um, uh, Bruce's Beach. Um, there's an effort going on right here in Hayward around Russell City. Um, there was a, a whole arriving um, black and brown community there on the shoreline of Hayward, you know, 20 minutes from where I, I'm sitting right now. That mm -hmm. was... Um, destroyed. It was basically taken by eminent domain. It's now an industrial park. Um, but the, this was, this was in the fifties, uh, and early sixties. So those residents are here, you know, many of them are in Oakland. Um, and so there's mm -hmm. actually a whole, uh, initiative around, um, reparations for, uh, the residents of Russell cities. So there have been the reparations. There have also been, um, 
other projects where there were community investments, meaning that the community had an opportunity to invest in the project. Um, I haven't seen anything where they were able to invest um, uh, to this degree or on a project this large. But, you know, there's one example in San Diego, um, Market Creek, where there were um, community investments in a shopping center and people could, you know, put their hundred dollars in and, you know, you have enough hundred dollars and you have, um, that, um, you have, um, some community ownership, a stake, right. Mm -hmm. But there was also a, a significant, you know, kind of uh, philanthropic project. Um, here in Oakland, we've got a, um, there was a movement around DPOs or direct public offerings where non-accredited investors, meaning much smaller investors, could make investments. In this case, it was a um, shopping, uh, it was a grocery store, right? It has since failed, but again, that was a community investment. So there are examples of community investments in projects. What we're trying to do is something different. One, this is a massive hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollar project, right? So the scale is much bigger. The significance is much greater. It's, you know, the, the major transit center in that region. Um, there's a housing component. There's a commercial component. Um, you know, it's just a, a much greater scale. And we are... Um, really seeking a much greater investment um, by the community such that it generates a, a significant return on investment that then can be um, through a community informed governance process be reinvested in the black community to um, fund the measures of harm repair. And with that, we're not just looking at um, the people that were displaced in their housing. So through eminent domain, some houses were displaced, some businesses were displaced, some churches were displaced, right? And the general fabric of the community was, you know, there's a giant scar. The community at that time was able to get the, um, the tracks undergrounded right there as it came into Berkeley. Um, and that was a big win for them because of course, anything on the under, other side of the tracks is on the underside, other side of the tracks. That's typically means, you know, that it's um, under, there's under investments in the communities on the other side of the tracks. And, right, it's demarcation. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't matter where you go. That that's right. why it's a uh, that's why it's a phrase. Um, right. And uh, like I'm from San Francisco, and there have been a number of uh, transportation infrastructure projects in San Francisco, and like anywhere, black communities do not do well in you know in the face of large scale infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure projects. Uh, in San Francisco, we got Gary Boulevard, we got the T line, you know, and all of them portend, you know, what is to come, which is, you know, bad news for, you know, uh, in Oakland, we've got the BRT or the bus rapid transit, you know, it all portends, you know, bad news for us, uh, typically. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so, there is the displacement, just to go back to, to my point, there is the displacement, but the harms go beyond that. So we started with, you know, kind of housing displacement, which then leads you know, housing and business displacement, because that's around economic opportunity, right? Right. With homes uh, and equity from homes being the major source of wealth. It allows you to do X, Y, and Z. 
start a business, send your kids to, to, to uh, school, all the rest of that good stuff. So that's more easily or straight forward in terms of quantifying the harm there, right? But it also goes to education, right? The schools are better if the property values. If you don't have the education, you know, your, your trajectory is off. The health, um, the, 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 the health outcomes are worse in those, in those same communities. The life expectancy is much lower in those communities. The public safety is much less. The incarceration is much greater. So what's the value of taking a black man out of the household to that family? What's the impact there, right, when he's of earning age? The health, the environmental impacts, you know, are much greater. So our goal with the help of, um, you know, with uh, Healthy Black Families as the lead is to really quantify harm. We only started with the housing piece because it was a straightforward kind of formula that we used and we came up with a number, I don't know, $3.2 billion, right? That's the harm. Not that we're going to ask for a check for $3.2 billion, but we have to create the data narrative to, to set the context for what it is that we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, right? Right. Uh, look at uh, life expectancy, right? So now we gotta, now we got to figure out as we're quantifying harm, what is the value of a black life, right? If the life expectancy is 10 years less than it is only a couple of miles away in the hills as a result of where people live, and we're trying to, to reverse, correct, remedy that harm, we have to put a number on it. What is the value of a black life? 10 years times X number of dollars times so many years times so many people. You're going to come up with a number. Same thing with, you know, everything else. So that's kind of part of the work that we're um, helping with is to come up with formulas that are defensible so we can create those data narratives, so we can come up with a context, so we can start to develop solutions that rise to the magnitude of the problems. And that's going to look like this. It's going to look like a cradle to grave approach to repairing the communities that have been harmed. That's early childhood education. That's education. That's workforce development. That's uh, elder care. That's health care, right? Like that we've kind of uh, limited or we have boiled these buckets, we're calling these buckets of harm repair down to four or five. It gets a little harder when you talk about social justice and things like that, but we do mm -hmm. have ways to um, that we can structure harm repair such that it can um, programmatically be designed and directed by the community. And we just want to make sure that there is sufficient buy-in for this to this effort to be sustained uh, in perpetuity, right? Because that's really what it's going to take. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, they say that the best time to plant an apple tree was you know, last year or whatever it is, like 10 <laughs> years ago. Next, next best time is right now. So we are planting that apple tree right now. Right, right. So how will Equitable Black Berkeley raise the funding necessary to actualize this project? Okay, so that one is kind of complicated. So Equitable Black Berkeley um, or Equity for Black Berkeley is not responsible for making uh, raising or really actualizing the project itself. Um, and that's uh, a lot of it is ultimately going to be up to the developer that's selected. Um, 
Equitable Black Berkeley is responsible, though, for creating a framework uh, for the financing and raising funds to ensure that the stakeholders of EBB um, have significant financial positions in the project. So we want to be early investors in the project such that we have there's a return on investment that can then support programs moving forward. Um, and all of the strategies are evolving right now, but they have basically been broken into two, you know, kind of uh, areas um, or, or tranches. One is the capital expenditure, which is going to um, uh, provide for that equity stake. And then the second part is the revenue that will support operating of the programmatic um, interventions or harm repair measures. Written, edited, and hosted by Deborah Hailu, Telling Our Stories Program Coordinator, Healthy Black Families, Inc. Audio engineered by Adrian Davis and Salim Najee Ula of One Hitter Entertainment. Shout out to James Shields of Creative Shields for our beautiful podcast artwork. Akila Shaheed, Office and Media Manager at Healthy Black Families, Inc. for the many ways she steps up and bridges our gaps. And Wilhelmina Wilson, Executive Director at Healthy Black Families, Inc. for bringing all of this together. Casting out the net of Black love in service of all humanity, this has been Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. See you next time.